Welcome to uh, Second Humanist Society of New York's annual, sixth annual, Free Thought Day celebration. Uh, I'm asking you, <laughs> okay, what the hell? Uh, we celebrate Free Thought Day on October 12th, and this year we're lucky, it, it fell on a Sunday. But all of October is Free Thought Month in the Free Thought community, because on October 12th in 1692, Governor William Phipps of Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, declared that, quote, spectral evidence, unquote, would no longer be admissible in court, thereby bringing an end to the infamous Salem witch trials. The spectral evidence that uh, Governor Phipps referred to consisted of the shrieks and convulsions exhibited by the, quote, victims of witchcraft, mostly young girls when they were in the presence of supposed witches. Someone accused would be brought in front of them, and on cue, the girls would thrash about and scream that invisible demons controlled by the accused were tormenting them. Case closed. How did otherwise sane people believe that dozens of their friends and neighbors were in league with the devil? Blind religious fanaticism. As Laura Miller said in her review on Salon of Richard Francis's book, uh, Judge Sewell's Apology, The Salem Witch Trials and the Forming of an American Conscience, uh, Laura Miller said, the colonists still had one foot in a medieval worldview. They saw human beings as pawns in a cosmic battle between forces of good and evil that were real, palpable, supernatural entities operating outside the individual self. Let's face it, the Puritans that we celebrate as the founding fathers of American representative democracy were religious fanatics who believed that everyone who did not believe as they did was not only doomed to eternal hellfire, but was an actual agent of Satan. The history of that little colony of believers from the first landing of 37 Puritans out of the 102 passengers on the Mayflower in 1620, right up to the Salem witch trials in 1692, is a chronology of fanatic Christian fundamentalism gone wild. In 1630, 10 years after they first landed, 900 more Puritans emigrated to Massachusetts Bay, led by John Winthrop, who became the colony's first governor. And immediately, now that they were the overwhelming majority, they began using tax money to support ministers of their Congregationalist Church. In 1631, they restricted the right, the vote and the right to hold office to members of the church. By 1635, non-members were required to attend church services. And in 1638, non-members were taxed, like it or not, to pay for the preaching that might lead ultimately to the, their conversion. By the way, if they didn't, they were whipped publicly in town square. And although the Massachusetts General Colony, General Court, did not pass a law proposed by John Endicott, one of the colony's founding fathers, that would have required women to wear veils. Sound familiar? In 1646, the court did make religious heresy punishable by death. In fact, in Boston, the Puritan fathers burned Catholic priests and executed several Quakers, by definition heretics, between 1659 and 1661. Cotton Mather, the famed Puritan cleric, led the war cries against New England's Abenaki Indians, those savages who were not Christians. They had learned their prayers from the French Jesuits. Christians? No, they're not Christians, they're Catholics. The Salem witch trials were not an aberration. They were the almost logical outgrowth of three quarters of a century of religious fanaticism and a med medieval belief in devils, demons, and witches until William V said, enough. <coughs> After 19 people had been hanged and one pressed to death with rocks for acts of witchcraft based on evidence from specters, angels, and devils, and 52 more were awaiting trial, Phipps stopped the proceedings, quote, because I saw many innocent persons might otherwise perish, unquote. 
from October 12, 1692 on, evidence admitted in court in Massachusetts had to be observable to the ordinary senses. As the Freedom from Religion Foundation today points out, there are many holidays honoring saints and superstition, but this is the only one commemorating reason and free thought. So, raise a glass to Governor Pip, Pips and drink freely all day long. Pips. Okay. Michael Heck is the prolific author of award-winning books of philosophy, history, and poetry. We first met Jennifer uh, with the publication of her book, Doubt, in 2003. Um, I guess we met here in 2004. At any rate, um, Doubt was so popular, we, it was a group sort of like this, Four people joined the Secular Humanist Society in New York because they enjoyed that evening so much. And one of them gave me $80 for two years. <laughs> the End of the Soul, Scientific Modernity, Atheism, and Anthropology, also uh, published in 2003, won the Phi Beta Kappa Society's 2004 prestigious Ralph Waldo Emerson Award for, quote, for scholarly studies that, are that contribute significantly to interpretations of the intellectual and cultural condition of humanity, unquote. Um, I also read Jennifer's 2007 book, The Happiness Myth, The Happiness Myth, Why What We Think Is Right Is Wrong, A History of What Really Makes Us Happy, which the critic Lawrence Weschler called a profound and lucid romp of a book and which I call one of my favorite books of the decade. Um, Jennifer's latest book is Stay, A History of Suicide and the Arguments Against It, which I assume she may bring up in uh, this afternoon's talk. Um, an honorary member of the Secular Humanist Society of New York since 2003, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Michael Hecht. Okay, great. Thank you so much for coming. What a delight to be here and to celebrate this day. It's lovely. Um, as I said in the sort of blurb for the talk, I want to talk about you know, the meaning of life. <laughs> Little things. The notion that we, that we can't really talk about the meaning of life, that we can't really talk about morality, that we can't really talk about ideals anymore, because these things used to be backed by this invisible meaning generator, God. And we have been talking for about 150 years about the idea that without this meaning generator of God, all these things that we've been doing for a couple of millennia no longer make sense because it was all based on this idea. And what I found in studying history is that some of this is a real, it's a perspective problem that in some ways the West and its idea about the afterlife, about a God who makes meaning, are so particular and so strange that when we talk about meaninglessness and there being no basis for morality and there being no afterlife and this being a terrible problem, that all of this is a hangover from a very peculiar idea of, of Western monotheism that most of humanity, and I find myself the only one saying this, pi, pi is coming. <laughs> most of humanity, I argue, and it's funny, again, I find myself the only one arguing this, but I never find anyone arguing it against it. Uh, it always seems to be persuasive enough, um, so I invite you to look into it as well. But uh, my, my notion is that most people who have ever existed have not had the idea of a god, or an afterlife, or some kind of tertiary source of meaning. Think first of all the millions of Confucians, 
There's no supernaturalism endemic to Confucianism. There are communities of Confucianism that are, because of the areas in which they grew up, they are also related to certain supernatural ideas. But Confucianism at its base is a system of ideas that is basically you respect those who are higher status than you and you sacrifice in order to take care of people who are lower status than you. And if everybody does that, this love, this idea of morality is as deeply felt, as, as weirdly internally felt, as any version we've ever come up with. And it's totally secular. The ancestor worship that they suggest is not worship in a supernatural sense, but a respect towards one's elders and people who've come before. Um, Again, so Confucianism, Theravada Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism has a certain amount, amount of Buddhist universes, Buddhaverses, and, and other kinds of uh, karmic, but Theravada Buddhism is as practical and realistic as an exercise program. Do this stuff and you'll get muscles. You don't want to do it? Fine. You want to try it? Try it. It works or it doesn't work. And it's a matter of trying to get your mind to a different place, which is a very rationalist thing to be doing. So if you just count Theravada Buddhism and Confucianism, you're already onto a hint that a lot of people haven't had this idea of a god who makes sense of all these human emotions. But now notice that when you, when you do scholarship on the afterlife, you immediately find total agreement that the idea of the afterlife shows up at a particular moment in history. We see it in the ancient Egyptian world, but it's only for the pharaohs. Most people are totally aware that they're going to live and then die. It's just for the pharaohs. And then after about two millennia, it becomes also for the upper class. You can buy your way in. But it's never for everybody. The idea of an afterlife comes into the Western world through Isaiah, who says the weirdest stuff you can imagine, but it sort of suggests that maybe as a group we're going to live on if we don't deny anything. But it's not at all a personal afterlife. And no two people would even get that idea out of Isaiah. It's so weird. But as it goes on, it gets a little bit more developed. And then, influenced by the Jewish idea, the Greek world comes up with the mystery religions. The mystery religions are around in the Hellenistic period. The Hellenic period, when you think of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, those three great philosophers come at the very end of the Greek classical age. Plato is already saying, Plato is the middle of them, right? It's Socrates teaches Plato, Plato teaches Aristotle, Aristotle teaches Alexander the Great, who dismantles the polis system. So you can sort of, if you can remember that, you can sort of. Plato says all the young people today are atheists. None of them believe in Zeus and Hera. First chapter of Doubt, of my book Doubt, is called Whatever Happened to Zeus and Hera. And what happened to Zeus and Hera was that individual philosophers or just normal smart people looked up and said, wait a second, she killed that guy because he slept? Wait, this is not good behavior. These people behave like madmen. They're jealous and crazy. This, and another one uh, notices that, well, it wasn't like the meteor hit his backyard, but there was a knowledge in Greek culture that a meteor had come down and everyone could visit it, and it was a rock. And everyone knew it was hot when it came down. So, thesis went up. Everything up there is a hot rock. And a lot of people agreed. The more that the Greek, uh, even uh, the idea that people started writing back histories for some of these characters, like, oh, Zeus, yeah, he comes from Crete, yeah, he was just, you know, he was a Cretan guy, but he was special at a certain time, and so he got built up into a god idea. So piece by piece, from different rationalist questions, we start, we, we see the dismantling of the Olympian gods. And of course, just like with our gods, they go into allegory first. People say, oh, it was never meant to be taken seriously. It was always meant as this, like, and people believe it as allegory first. And then after a while, when philosophy and skepticism become really sophisticated, 
no one buys any of this. You know, one of the great skeptical questions was, uh, the gods are in the form of humans. Does that mean they have spleens? Do they have butts? Do they use them? So are we saying gods defecate? How disgusting and unreasonable. Cannot be true. So why are they in human form if they don't have the human insides? Ridiculous. Forget about it. Are they children at some point? Ridiculous. Forget about it. How did they make the world? Did they make the world? Ridiculous. Nature seems to be totally capable of reproducing itself. Patterns. The Greeks figured it out. The uh, ancient Karvaka, 600 BC, is the earliest definite, clear, extant, extensive atheism doubt that I found. 600 BC in the Indus River Valley in what is now India. They said, you know, if there are souls without bodies, there should also be mangoes hanging in the air without trees, but they aren't. <laughs> They said brains are usually kind of gray and squishy. I don't think there's a brain hanging out in the sky. They said, if you think we should burn your parents after death to send them to the great heaven, <coughs> why not get them there now? Let's burn them now. You don't believe it, do you? They would say. The whole thing was made up by priests, they say, for the money, or politicians, they said, for the control. This is 600 BC. This is before the Buddha. We believe the Buddha was influenced by the ancient Karvaka. And that was part of the reason that he stepped away from the karma idea of, of Hinduism and evolved this idea into a more rationalist system where, hey, this is how it really works. We are humans, but we can notice that we're kind of just animals with two little eyes, and if we could see out of the eyes of all the other humans, forget anything other than supernatural, if we could only see out of the eyes of all of us, we would obviously see a much bigger picture than what we see now. So let's try to train ourselves out of the individualism. But, but the Buddha's notion comes out of a Karvakan idea, which, by the way, everything we have from the Karvaka is, was saved by its enemies. At, in polemics. So much of the history of atheism was saved by its enemies in polemics. So they burned the books, <coughs> but they saved major chapters in order to argue against them. And so that's why we have them now. The, the notion of our being profoundly bereft because we've lost this particular vision of God and religion that we've recently lost in the West, in this part of the world, um, is so alleviated by looking through history and seeing, hey, most people have not lived with, with a creator God. Which means, if most of these cultures have not been saying that life is meaningless, <coughs> that maybe we should stop saying that, oh, we've lost God, so life is meaningless. We're getting over something. We're getting over a very weird proposition. You know, the Greek gods didn't make the world, nor were they utter morality. They weren't all good. We expected them to behave badly. The West invented a god of this disgusting planet that does the things to children that you know it does, and innocent older people as well. We made up a god who's all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. It makes no sense. So all the complications of Catholicism, especially, are based on this notion of how are we going to figure this out? This can't be right. So you make up limbo for the babies who weren't baptized because it seems insane to blame them. And then you got to make a purgatory. What about good people who were bad at the moment of their death? The whole construct gets complex because we'd invented an all-good God, an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good God running a planet, which is horrific. Can't work. But not every cultural, uh, either supernaturalism or what you would call religion, which in many cases, religion is not always tied to supernaturalism or an afterlife or meaning. Human beings have been as smart as we are now for about 200,000 years. In every generation, there have been some people who looked up and said, that sounds stupid, I don't believe that. 
Now, I didn't really realize that until I wrote Doubt. I, I was a historian already. I'd written a book called uh, The End of the Soul, Scientific Modernity, Atheism, and Anthropology, which was about a bunch of late 19th century anthropologists who were literally dissecting each other's... Oh, Jesus, it's my phone. <laughs> and it's my husband, how strong. They were dissecting each other's brains. They donated their bodies to each other so that after death they could dissect each other's brains to find relationships between brain morphology and personality traits and ability. Now they did this for a very good scientific reason, which was that Paul Broca, the truth is they'd invented anthropology. Before Darwin is translated into French, which happens late, Darwin writes in 59, 1859, it's translated into French in 71 by Clémence Royer, a woman, a French woman, who is such an atheist that she writes a huge preface saying that Darwinism proves atheism and that humanity developed from the animals. And she scolds him for being so shy about it. You know, in Origin of the Species, he mentions human beings in the last sentence of this giant book about finches and dogs. <laughs> and in the last sentence he says, this may shed light on the origins of humanity. And she puts the intro in and, says, and immediately says, well, the English figured it out. The French had figured it out before through Lamarck, but Lamarck had a slightly wrong idea. But remember, Darwin thought Lamarck was right in a lot of cases. You know Lamarck? Yes. Lamarck's are, are just a, a, a early, just earlier than uh, Darwin. He's, he's around in the uh, French Revolution and in many ways is, is reflecting the political notion of the French Revolution that we can change stations. But he doesn't have a mechanism. Not Darwin's mechanism. You know Darwin's uh, uncle also had, no, his grandfather, uh, Erasmus Darwin. He wrote a verse book, one of the last verse science books, because science by the end of the 19th century realized, let's take on this authoritative voice that sounds different from poetry. So Erasmus Darwin writes in verse an argument for evolution. He just doesn't have a mechanism. Certainly not a good mechanism like Darwin. What Darwin came up, I mean, even Plato said, here are all these animals. If you don't believe anything supernatural, I guess we all got here from each other the same way plants seem to grow and evolve and change. Um, but nobody had had a mechanism. Darwin's great thought is, oh, right, if it doesn't work, it dies and it goes in another direction. Add a lot of details to that, but that's the basic <laughs> idea. If you can't make babies, so nobody wants to sleep with you, you're in trouble. You get eaten by a lion, you're in trouble. You can't raise your children to the age of sexual maturity, you're in trouble. Doesn't matter if you can do those other things. You've got to get them to carry it on too. But that's basically it. Stay away from getting eaten, find something to eat, get babies to maturity. Um, I mean, if you're a guy, you can just seed it up a little bit and hope that some of the women get the maturity. But somebody around here has to get somebody to maturity, otherwise it doesn't work. So these are the evolutionary goals, right? Um, and that's really what Darwin figures out, that there's a method for making these changes. Um, and he, of course, noticed that farmers had been doing this all along um, for specific goals. But you know what the farmers thought at the time was that if you stopped intervening, if you stopped picking the fastest racehorse, that within a couple generations it would revert back. Mm. It, it just hadn't been formulated that this was actually a way of creating. I will say, and this is totally off topic, but that's my MO, I'm afraid. Um, before Darwin, the idea of evolution was the religious position. Because the Bible said Adam and Eve started humanity. That's just one man and one woman, and they're white. So where'd all the Chinese and black and interesting other people come from? So it seemed like evolution was the only way to keep Adam and Eve where they were supposed to be, the only origins. And it must be that after that everybody turned brown and interesting. So it was the secularists who were arguing, ah, there was no Adam and Eve, there are different Adam and Eves all over the place. It was the biblical ones who were angry at that idea. I just mentioned this to show you how incredibly historically specific these arguments are. You know, the argument about evolution. Why aren't we arguing about cosmology? The Bible says Joshua bid the sun stand still. Why aren't they out there yelling at us that the sun is moving around the earth? 
And the answer is, it's very historically specific. There was a moment when the tennis, when there weren't, Jesse cut it, when there weren't uh, a lot of high schools in the United States, certainly in the South. The government mandated at the turn of the century high schools. Well, what are you going to teach in these high schools? So they start churning out these textbooks. And that's when William Jennings Bryan decides we don't want to send our kids to these governmental schools where they're going to indoctrinate them. Let's go through the book and find something to fight about. And that's when they, I mean, all of this is documented. It's clear that he wanted to find something to fight about before he looks in the textbook. Then he looks in the textbook, finds the evolution says, thing, and says, let's fight on this. He's writing for a journal that's called The Fundamentals. And that's where our word, the fundamentalists, come from. Before that, it's orthodoxy, or you, you know, you can find a Hasidism called in, Ger in, in German or in, in, in Judaism. But the idea of fundamentalism is a historically specific thing that begins in the beginning of the, 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 the 20th century um, from William Jennings Bryan, right? And of course, as you know, the Scopes trial seemed like we won, and we did win for decades. But another historically specific thing brought it up again in, in the uh, second half of the 20th century very much uh, motivated by, and this is another sort of insight that I've been arguing for a while, um, because I was really curious about what had happened. Uh, the 20, early 20th century is a better time to be a public atheist than even now. In, in 1913, the New York Times sends a reporter to Thomas Edison to say, do you believe in the afterlife? Why? Because, because William James is at Harvard, and he is a philosopher, he's brilliant, and he doesn't think there's an afterlife, but he thinks, maybe? So he says to his people, if I die, I'll contact you if it's in any way possible. So in 1913, one of his old secretaries says, he contacted me. And everybody goes crazy thinking maybe. You gotta understand this is a period where we're losing a lot of young boys and even very rationalist parents, because World War I is on. Even a lot of rationalist grown-ups, the idea that some people are talking about maybe there's an afterlife and maybe he's gonna rap on your table and maybe he's not really gone. It's a little too tempting. So a lot of very secular people are thinking, well, look, uh, x-rays turned out to be real. That was weird. Germs, tiny little things making us sick. That's bizarre, but that turned out to be real. So maybe there's some sort of an afterlife. That is, they knew better. But you know, even the Curies went to these meetings and stuff. A lot of it was sorrow about the losses that were happening in this period. So. Um, Max, uh, now I've wandered. Um, 913. 1913. So, much, you're so, good. so they send a reporter to find out what Emerson thinks about that William James has come back from the dead. And, and Edison tells the Times reporter, there is no afterlife. Proof, proof, that is what I believe in. There is no afterlife, he says. And they put it on the front page of the New York Times. And he does suffer a little business-wise, but he writes a ridiculously hilarious apology in which he basically reiterates that he doesn't believe in God, but if you people really need me to, uh, all right, maybe there's a non-personal God, that, but in any case, any idea of afterlife or prayer or any, yeah, all that's ridiculous. What I'm trying to say is that in the early 20th century, you didn't have to be a full-time atheist to be an out loud and proud atheist. You could be in another discipline. Now, watch who we are now. Most of the out loud and prouds are making a living at it. And most people who aren't making a living at being an atheist are a little bit more. Why? Because of the Cold War. The Cold War, you know, it's funny. We, uh, we were talking about the Puritans a moment ago. John gave us that wonderfully interesting uh, uh, presentation. The, the, the thing to remember is, you know, when in the early 1500s, Calvin, well, first Luther and then Calvin, say, uh, how could there be a God who makes us, knows what he's doing when he makes us, sends us down here, 
has us do the bad things he programmed us to do, because he's all-knowing, and then sends us to burn in hell for eternity? Crazy. So Luther and Calvin decide he must know beforehand, and he sends us down with this idea, and we're just walking. I mean, this is a revolt against the idea that there could be a judge who's impartial judging this world, right? So the Calvinist countries are mostly in Europe. England is going to be the good daughter of the church and reiterates this. Henry, Henry VIII says to the church, to the Pope, don't you worry about a thing. But then he gets horny. <laughs> he, he also can't seem to get a son, and he doesn't know about biology yet, that it's his XY chromosome that's problematic, though now even that's becoming interesting in, in scientific studies. The egg does seem to have some choice. It seems to put up a little barrier sometimes. But in any case, Henry thought that it was the women's problem, and he, so, he, so he divorces, you know, so he starts, he starts uh, uh, divorcing and beheading his wives. But in order to do the first one, divorcing, he goes to the Pope and says, could you divorce me so I can marry this cutie who won't give it up unless I do? Anne Boleyn, she was very sick. So the Pope says, any time, hon, I do it all the time. But right now, Charles X has me captive, and I'm going to get killed if I do this because my, that's my uh, niece, your first wife. So I can't do it right now. Wait until Charles X lets me out. He's the Holy Roman Empire, emperor at the time. So Henry says, I'd love to, but I can't wait. Things are pressing. <laughs> and so he breaks with the church to get with Anne Boleyn. That's the origins of English Protestantism, very unlike the origins of these other places where it was philosophical. So he's running a Catholicism that we call Smells and Bells Protestantism. It's Catholicism without the Pope being in charge. That's it. So his first successor is from a daughter from his first marriage. How angry was she? Right? Mom got divorced. She was raised Catholic, as was Henry VIII and everybody else in England. So she was mad that mom got divorced for Protestantism. So she's Mary, and she's Bloody Mary. And she's not that bloody. She burns people mostly. It's not a lot of blood. But so she burns a lot of people. Uh, Catholics. Because she's more angry at Catholicism. You see? So the next, when she's done, it's Elizabeth, whose mother was gotten because of Protestantism. So Elizabeth is fine with it. And she makes up a Protestantism that lasts to this day as <laughs> Anglicanism that's very Catholic. She doesn't want to piss off the Catholics. She wants them to stop revolting, to stop fighting with her. And they do. Because she puts everything back in the, in the common book of prayer that the Catholics want, except the Pope. And she even says, the Pope's a great guy. We listen to him. He's just not the boss. Most Catholics say good enough. So who's the outlier in England at the time? Only the purest version of Protestantism, the Puritans. And they can't take being so cut out. And they get on the boat. So that's why the people who come here are real freaks. Everybody else made their peace with this very soft. Uh, so when we come here and start acting like this, we put it in the perspective of Puritanism was a ver like a almost version of fundamentalism, same kind of word, right? I went off there. I always come up to the top, of, to the stage with something to say, and then I say whatever comes to me. But what I wanted to talk to you guys about was the notion of how meaning can be discussed in a context outside of any kind of religious model. And by religious model, I mean something supernatural supporting what I believe to be worthy of the word magic, which is the weird stuff that goes on between human beings. Being a human being is very strange. The fact that the meat thinks is the weirdest thing anyone's ever thought of. Virgin birth? Ha! The meat thinks. The meat wrote Shakespeare. The meat wrote Mozart. All of you and me we have this little glob of meat, and we're looking out of these little holes, and we're 
communicate. The whole thing is bizarre. Religion was only copying the strangeness of being human when it set up all these eggs cracking and universes popping out and whatnot. The reality is the great poetic, amazing, wacky truth. And being human, no matter how much you sort it out in any kind of lab, is not about anything measurable or plotable. The real experience of being human is weird, strange, peculiar, bizarre, any synonym you want. We are bizarre. The lab, what is a lab? Could this be a lab? The reason that labs look like labs what labs are, are places where variables are limited so I can tell that this caused this. Because in this world, I can't tell what happened, right? But on Long Island still, the breast cancer rate is above most other places. Why? We've been trying to figure it out for decades. But we can't. Why is the heart disease rate in the United States so much higher than in other places? Why in Asian countries is it so much lower, but as soon as they move here, within the generation, not even two generations, their heart disease hits where ours is. We've been trying to figure it out. Oh, they eat less meat, it must be that. They eat more fish, it must be. Every time we think of something, we change how we eat for 10 years, and then we decide that's not it. We don't know, and we don't know because this world is extremely variable. That's what a lab is. That's what all the glass and tile is about. How can we limit variables? So the dog is, the, the person is sick. We take a little blood, we put it in a petri dish. It grows a lot of different things. All right, take some blood from a healthy person. It grows a lot of things. What's weird about this one? Maybe this is what it is. Let's take some of it, put it in a healthy, maybe dog, see if that comes back. You see how all, the lab place allows me to limit variables till I can figure out that causes this. Brilliant, we need this. But life is more like poetry. Life is, it's all coming in at once. There is no limitation of variables. We choose what we're paying attention to. The experience that we're all having here right now is somewhat dependent on what I'm saying and what you think, but also on the room temperature, on whether you're quitting smoking at the moment, on whether you're hungry, whether you want it, you're sleepy. The huge experience of being a human being is something that, at best, the most crazy poetry might be able to approximate. But really, we are something that is both scientific and artistic. And to understand what goes on for us, History is a better rule than science. Science is so helpful. I, I made up the term poetic atheism uh, almost as soon as doubt came out because I would be giving these talks and I would find these rooms where people seemed convinced that science was the great friend of atheism. And historically, poets and artists, why would you be a poet or an artist? It's exhausting and there's no money in it. You do it because you're desperate for truth, to figure out something that seems real to you. And if religion doesn't work, that's why you're going to turn to it. Keats was spitting up blood already. He had tuberculosis. He'd already buried his mother. He'd already buried his brother. He was spitting blood into his handkerchief. What are you talking about? Keats. John, John Keats, Keats, the British poet. poet yeah. So he looks at himself and he says, when I have thoughts that I may cease to be, does he then start talking about Jesus, God, the afterlife? No. He says, I go down to the beach till time and love <coughs> cease to be. Till he, he looks at the ocean and he loses himself in time. It's a secular answer to a problem. He never brings up these other answers. And you see it in Emily Dickinson, and you see, it, you see it in all these great poets. And then in the modern period, you see them actually saying, Wallace Stevens says, poetry is because we lost religion. Now poetry used to do a lot of things, but now this is our source of the transcendent. Um, Elizabeth Bishop, well, I could go on for it. Picasso was an atheist, out loud and proud. Um, so. What I see is the Cold War. Um, the Cold War, that's right, that's why I went back. 
Elizabeth was trying to be relatively pro-Catholic. The only reason she stops and really cements Anglicanism as not Catholicism is because Philip of Spain decides to send the Armada to take back England for the Pope. Really, he just wants to conquer England. And he's got these big boats and a much larger army. Well, she's been putting money into these quick little boats and good guns. And it doesn't matter how many men you got. She gets these quick little boats. As long as your guns fire like a foot longer than the other guy, you're safe. And she's got these quick little maneuverable boats. And she just ruins the armada. But it was Philip attacking her that made Catholicism treasonous. And a Cold War that made atheism treasonous in the United States. Um, this is a contention that came clear to me while I was writing Doubt, and I, I've been sort of putting it all over the place, and now I'm sort of seeing it come back into the culture. And I, 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 I think it's such an inspiring notion nowadays because as of eight, uh, 1989, when the wall comes down, but then 2001, with the, you know, with 9-11, that our most murderous enemy in this culture is with people who are more religious than we who see us as secular. You know, God went on our money and into our pledge in the 50s, in 54 and 56, specifically, you can read the congressional records, to separate ourselves from godless communism. Well, that's not an issue anymore. So it's made room for the rise of the new atheism. It's made room for a, a, a larger conversation. But the more you know about history, the more you see and nothing new about it. It was that the Cold War shut it down for a couple of decades, and it shut it down intensely. You, you could lose everything. Because if you're an atheist, you might be a communist. If you're a communist, they can blacklist you, and you can not work. Your children starve. I mean, it was intense enough, so it really did shut everything down. And, the, and we do have witnesses at the time who spoke of it, though no one yet has really written that up, and um, I hope to get to it, uh, because it's a, that's a fascinating story. Um, so what I'm looking at now is we're in this 21st century, we're trying to look towards the future, and there's so much that seems hopeless, uh, and I'm just as depressed as the most depressed person in the room about the future, right? It looks very dark and difficult. But what kind of tools do we have about what we know ourselves as, uh, of, uh, ourselves as human beings can we use to start thinking more broadly about And I've kind of gotten... Uh, uh, a kind of system through which I'm looking at this in terms of, well, the first one is morality. How do we talk about morality? We used to think that morality was something that was sort of underwritten by God, right? So there's right and wrong, obviously. You kill me, I might kill you, that's bad, let's not do it. But what about the part of morality when, what about when nobody's looking? Why don't you steal when nobody's looking? Why wouldn't you kill a person if nobody would find out? It's because we have feelings that give us some inclination about who we want to be. It's morality. I don't believe in God. Indeed, I'm sure there's no God. Because, look, if you don't know history, then you can say, oh, agnosticism's necessary, I can't prove a negative. But look, I know there's no Superman. I don't have to walk around saying I can't prove a negative, maybe there's a Superman. Because I know when Superman was invented. I know what influenced the invention. Well, that's how I feel about God. I know when the afterlife came around. I know how it grew. I know where it grew. I know where the idea of a, look, even in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me. I can see that this thing developed. Am I an idiot? I don't have to say that maybe this fictional thing might be true. I don't have to respect every cockamamie. That's an old word, I enjoy. Um, but the point is that, that if you are sure, as I am, that there is no God, especially look at the animals, jeez. If there were no other animals, I might say, oh, thinking is really cool. Maybe there's some thinking thing out there. Come on, surrounded with all these other animals who are clearly thinking, clearly die when they're done. Even Ecclesiastes says, why should we think that, God, that a dog dies differently than a man, dust to dust? It's in every uh, hotel room. You can read a nice secular treatment. <laughs> vanity, vanity. It's all is vanity. 
an elephant is not some go. idea of after life. Robert, let's we hold it, please. Yeah, after, after, after we'll do after. As a matter of fact, I'm going to wrap it up soon so we can do questions, because I would love to. Um, but I want to say, so for morality, the la the, my most recent book came out in December um, last year uh, with Yale, is, is called Suicide uh, um, Stay, an argument against Stay, a history of suicide and the philosophies against it. Um, we're going to, the paperback's about to come out and it'll be the arguments against it, which I, 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 I think is good partially because it's one less syllable, so easier to say than philosophies. <laughs> but also it reminds the, the reader quickly, I'm making an argument. It's not, it's not an even-handed treatment of suicide. I'm telling you, I don't think you should do it. I think it's wrong. And the reasons that I think it's wrong are entirely secular. One is the communitarian argument, which is that historically we see it observed, but now statistically there is no debate that one suicide causes more suicides. It happens in schools, it happens in professions, it happens in families. One suicide in a family means that for two generations that family's suicide rate is exponentially higher. So you kill yourself now, an unborn niece has a higher chance of not being able to live. I wrote this stuff, I got, I, somebody on the Daily Beast wrote um, that he was an ex-army ranger and that two of his ex-army ranger friends had killed themselves and that he read uh, a chunk of my book in a David Brooks article, obviously. Weird uh, bedfellows that you make in, when you're... Because <laughs> I didn't go with the program. The atheist program, progressive program, I'm supposed to say it's an autonomous, it's a pillar of our autonomy, we're each individuals, do whatever you want, that's what I'm supposed to say. But I stopped believing that as I did more research and found that secular philosophers throughout history have offered two different arguments, one being the communitarian, that you owe it to your community to stay. In the same way that you, if you're born in the United States, you have certain rules. If you're born, guess what? Whether you like it or not, we kind of need you, we kind of love you, and you need to stay. Um, of course, there's a level at which it needs to be adjudicated on its own terms. I have no, no problem with end-of-life decisions, and, and I think that even mental health decisions when they get to a point where your doctor and your spouse agrees that this is too much, it's a different category. So that, that's just a, a very loose rule, but if you know that everybody who knows you would disagree with the decision, that you're the person I'm talking to and saying, let's, let's hold back a little bit. Um, so for the despair suicide, the first argument is the communitarian, and the second is what you owe your future self. He might know things you don't know right now. As a matter of fact, if you judge from who you were 10 years ago, your 10 year hence person might know a lot, might be a lot. You don't have to respect him too much, but could you not kill him? Little request. Let's just find out. Let's have a little faith. And if we back that up a little bit, we get to remind ourselves of two things. The communitarian argument reminds us it's not just our responsibility to stay alive, it's that when we do stay alive, we're being of great use. Crying and useless is a million times better than dead. And that's the insight we need to stop torturing ourselves when we're in pain and saying, this life is terrible. It is terrible. I have noticed. It's very painful. But the notion is that there's a beauty to it and that we have to look towards our future, <laughs> that we have to look, we realize the amount of the degree to which we matter to other people becomes shockingly obvious when we find out that if you smoke, people around you are more likely to smoke. If you overeat or undereat, people are more. If you have three children or four children or one children, people around, we copy each other. This version of humanity that you and I are living in now is the weirdest. Until 1950, there were no how, that is, there's no record of a community with houses that have more rooms than people. 1950 in the United States is the first record we have of it. Used to be, if you were cold, you had to go to the best hearth in the room and you had to hang around with these idiots who are your friends and family, who all of us at all periods and moments in history notice, repeat themselves, aggrandize themselves, talk about you behind your back, and a million other reasons you would rather be in your room with a computer and a nice temperature. But until this moment in history, 
We were stuck together for entertainment. Even reading, most people couldn't. It was a communal activity. The reader read to everybody else. We were, and the cool breeze on the porch in the summer, we were stuck together. I'm mentioning the things you might not have thought of. Obviously, you know, to put up a barn, to do any of the work that needed to do so you could get food to eat, you needed other people. We live in a moment where it's possible to be in your own room with the right temperature and an endless entertainment that shuts off when it bothers you. And it's not so good for us. We never had the opportunity to try it before, and it's hard. We need to do this come together. This is one of the most important things that a person in this moment in history can do, especially people who are rationalists and who are not going to go along with just whatever the group think is, to come together. Um, in my book, The Happiness Myth, in a slightly different context, that I say it's great to come out of the closet, but you also have to leave the house. <laughs> and for politics, for, for how we feel as human beings, when you're helping to control your environment because you care about the community and you're showing up, it makes you happier. And when you're around other people, even though they drive you crazy, you will be a happier person. It just, we need it. Imagine yourself alone on the planet tomorrow. Would you do anything the same? We create meaning together. It's not individual. Meaning is communal and cultural. Remember when you were teenagers and you looked at all the houses going by when you were in a train and you thought, oh my god, I don't want to have a house and a family like all these other cookie cutter people. And then you grow up and you're like, I get a house? Family? Kids? It all changed. You realize that you had been critical of a notion of a cultural notion that actually turned out to be pretty nurturing, pretty successful. Obviously, you have to learn to fight against culture too, but the notion that God gave us meaning and without meaning, we are each. Sartre is really the only philosopher in all of history who really said that meaning is second to existence that you exist, you rise up, you create meaning, and whatever meaning you have in your whole life is what you create and nurture. I don't think so. Every other philosopher through history has said the opposite, and it seems the opposite to me, that we're born into a world that has some meaning, and we're allowed to take on some of that meaning, to borrow from other human beings and to borrow from our culture. Look, some of this is only somewhat true, but I need to put it next to this other stuff on the shelf because I don't think the abyss exists. The Confucianists didn't say there was an abyss. There's an abyss when God used to say that you could walk over this empty bridge and then he takes the bridge away because he doesn't exist. But if you didn't believe in that, you just wouldn't be looking over there. You'd be doing something else. The idea that there's this abyss is a profoundly Western notion. So we, there's a lot of ways in which, even though this life is incredibly difficult, it isn't difficult in the way that losing religion sometimes suggests to us. Um, I had about seven more categories I was going to talk about, um, but I think that what I'm going to do is ask you what you're thinking about, and I'll just try to, um, to, to, to go from there. Yeah. Sure. Uh, no, Max. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, okay. I'll stop. <laughs> Yeah, your new book, Suicide. I was thinking about Emile Durkheim. Yeah. And I'm thinking about Anime. Uh huh. And uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I retired and I had a, had a very busy life, had a lot of connections. And a lot of those connections have kind of evaporated. And then talking about uh, the technology, I mean, sometimes when I walk down the street, I just want to pull the cell phone so yeah. people can. Oh, yeah. It's like, um, on one level, yeah, you've got Match.com and you can right. connect. But there's yes. no, you can't go into a coffee shop. Right. There's a way in which it connects us, yeah. and there's a way in which it doesn't, right? And the most human connection of touch, of eye contact, of smell, of just being there with each other, that it's we're not taking care of as well. So it's something that my... My most optimistic response to it is, remember the boom boxes? Yeah. I think of all this technology as people who are walking down the street thinking thoughts they don't want to think, and they're just looking for something to block it out. So I really think that the next thing that comes out that will help them block it out 
um, or help sometimes me block it out. Uh, well, you know that. But this one is particularly interesting because of the contact. I, I, I'll mention um, so that everybody knows. Uh, he started with Emil Durkheim. Durkheim is really the first sociologist, so he's trained in sort of education and philosophy, and he creates sociology. It was already around. There were sociologists, but his <coughs> book, Suicide, big fat book, is the first book that's more statistics than anything else. That really, that re and that's how we start to say, okay, this dates sociology. Um, and what he finds remarkably lasts over a hundred years. Durkheim, French. So it's over a hundred years later, and we're still using his terms, which is pretty shocking. There's been a ton of critique about it, but still. And the basic idea, he's got four categories of suicides. I think they can distill down to two for this use of conversation, which is that basically in the West, we're lonely and alienated, and that's why we kill ourselves. And in the East, we're too enmeshed. And so that when we don't feel we're upholding the group's mor morality, we're so enmeshed that we're willing to take our lives for it. So nowadays, the East and the West has so mixed that it's a little trickier. But it is still a good watchword. And we can still look at the ancient world and see that their kind of suicide was mostly that same kind of enmeshed suicide. Um, and that it, it's that kind of suicide can be celebrated by, by the community. But our kind of suicide is almost always seen as, as a, a bad thing because someone's fallen out of our care. Um, we meant to hold them up, but we, we were too busy. Um, and Russia right in the middle between East and West. I have both. Yeah, interesting. Um, and Russia has its own um, uh, uh, story that's been so interesting. Uh, you know, when you look at atheism around the world these days, uh, the greatest atheism is in the countries that uh, are former communist, because the the atheism was sort of enacted, and once it was, a lot of people said, "Yeah, this makes sense." And a lot of people in these parts of the world, China, I mean, now is very educated in um, both Enlightenment atheism and uh, uh, <coughs> sort of more modern Western atheism. He read all that at school, and he talked about it. Um, I'm not saying all his followers did, but it was based in a Western notion of real scientific atheism. Um, and so now we look back at those areas and sometimes we think, oh, they're behind us in certain kind of ways. So we don't realize oh, they're very sophisticated in, in certain kinds of ways of thinking. The only thing is, once you legislate that religion is illegal, people who gather to meet against you because you're not letting them read the books you want right. for anything, the subversive, and um, you know, fighting words are now suddenly religious after you know millennia of it being the other way around, um, where you meet and you're subversive and you also are against the church because the church and the and the powers of government were working together so much in the West that you would reject one to reject the other. But once the state is both being obnoxious to you and insisting on atheism, it creates a different pocket, but it's still a pocket. Most of these worlds of Russia and China are, are extremely secular. Um, so I do wonder, did I speak yeah. to your question? Well, it's, um, uh, I, well I, I guess I think that you know, uh, we, we pride ourselves in having a good health system. Right. People are staying healthier, people are living longer. You know, you want philosopher moms, you got to put up with this. <laughs> you know, they're living longer, but it doesn't look like the culture of society has really structured something for people in this new, healthy, longer living age. No, we haven't. The cell phones are just like robots that are just mm. yeah. Community. Yeah, which again, which is why a meeting like this, yeah. it, these things that used to be, there are a lot of things that when our culture was relatively stable for centuries, it always changes. But before newspapers and trains and, and steamboats, which is the second half of the 19th century, most people lived in farming villages through most of history. Most people were engaged in trying to make food through most of history. And we lived in very similar ways, generation to generation. And some of these things can grow up so that you don't even notice that you're doing them. Because you had to go to church. It was illegal not to. 
And even after it wasn't, or in a few places that it wasn't, your whole family, your friends, it was the time to dress up, you were going to go out and have a drink after, everybody went. So nowadays, if you want to have that human part of your life, you got to plan for it. And that's true of meditation. That's true of both meditation in the quiet sitting thinking time and the quiet not thinking time. You've got to plan for it in a way that in throughout history in these long periods where we had worked out a lot of stuff because they'd been similar for a long time, some of this stuff came along with just living. But we have to look after it a little bit. You know, back then they had to look after a little freedom in ways that we don't. So it's not like it's, you know, all one or the other. But let me move on. I'm sure there are other questions or arguments or whatever. And, and, and anything's fine. You don't have to worry. Yeah. I'm not looking for an excuse, but what are the other two? You said that there were four. So sad. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other two are related to the first two. So, so it was about um, how you were... Uh, it was about how you were functioning in society. Frankly, I always felt that the two were, were the dominant aspects and that the other two have lost meaning in our period. There were, you know, there were still guilds and lots of cultural structures. And so he was thinking in terms of these. And indeed, he thought of before corporation was what we think of corporation, that was Durkheim's idea for maybe what the future would be, that we would have human corporations that were about friendship and gathering. He was a big old atheist. He said, um, you know, when you see a bunch of people, you know, hundreds of people get together and they feel something magical and special and weird happen, like if you go to a demonstration or you go to a concert that you love and it's outdoors and whatever, he said people are right to feel that something bigger than themselves that they could never create by themselves was there. They were just wrong, said Durkheim, to think it was God, it was the community. Mm -hmm but that we still have to look after that community. Because if you want a little ecstasy in your life, if you want joy, um, it's just not something human beings do by themselves very well. We need each other for all sorts of stuff. Another? Mm -hmm. How do you think uh, ancient people, before the advent of, as you pointed out, belief in the afterlife, handled the dreams where they would see people who lived and uh, yeah. died? Yeah. I mean, to me, that would indicates to them right. that there's some sort of right. other world, you know. That yeah, there's, a, there's sort of straightforward ways to answer that. It's an excellent question. There are certainly different communities that do different things, but we can see that, say, across ancient Greek culture, which we can study for hundreds of years, I mean, it went on and on and on, um, we can see that there were visions of people who were dead doing stuff, kind of ghost-like, but they don't last forever. They aren't expected to. They're usually showing up again because of some redress. They usually show up to do a little vengeance or ask for something or tell somebody something wrong is happening, and then they go to the grave. So there's a kind of space. Um, how that's conceptually arranged is different everywhere, but you're absolutely right that they would have dreams that they would take a lot of stock in. You know, Epicurus, uh, Hellenistic period, just one of my greatest heroes. And, and he wrote so much, and we only have a few letters, but the letters are so good. And we also have other people commenting on it, and we have all of Lucretius, who wrote this long poem based on Epicurus's ideas from centuries earlier. Um, and Lucretius had access to more material than we do, so we can, but even just the letters. You know, Lucretius says, look, we're all so, I mean, Epicurus says, we're all so scared. I'll set it up a little more, though. I know that's a problem. But, but just that the, the polises, the poli, had been the source of meaning. This is actually where I meant to start this talk, but I just... That, that the polises were a city-state which were understood to continue on after your death. Nobody had grave markers. You just belonged to your state. The only people at grave markers in all of these polices were women who died in childbirth only in Sparta. They were seen as these great heroes. They would put a name on it. But basically, you were living and dying for your polis. Each polis had its own gods, and you celebrated them, you partied, and when you partied, you partied with everyone, with the mailman and the butcher, and you were all going nuts together, all doing the same drug, usually wine, but I want to point out that a whole community doing the same drug can be a very bonding thing. <laughs> and, and just as democracy was mostly male, the crazy partying was mostly female. 
Um, that's a story I tell in doubt, which is, it's a very interesting, because we, we were, since we weren't given political power, we were allowed to be crazier. Um, and to be more animalist and God animalist and we would go out into the darkness and have like a three-day crazy party you know where some male God would visit us and whatnot but we would have a pretty good time um, but uh, the point is the polis would hold your meaning for you if you believed in the polis you believed in the people who came before you you believed in these gods you believe so this carried your self-future and into the past, and you could live for it, and it helped a lot. The policies were falling apart, first because of Darius, uh, 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 and then Alexander the Great. So, so first the city-states are conquered, and then Alexander the Great comes and conquers more territory than had ever been conquered, all the way from, all, all, you know, across the Mediterranean, all the way down into the Indus River Valley. And he mixes all these cultures together, partially by marrying a Persian princess, even though that was not what he was into, um, and, uh, <laughs> and encouraging his other generals to marry Persian princesses. Because otherwise, if conquering a place is no problem, it's holding it that's hard. But if you intermarry and you don't oppress and you don't push your religion on other people, sometimes they just let you stay, especially if you tax them less than the other guy was. So that's how Alexander did it. It's not so much the big deal of conquering these places, but of conquering them and not making them so angry that they throw you off as soon as you move the army to the next place to conquer. Right? So it's in this period that Epicurus is looking up and seeing that people have lost their way. They were upset. They were miserable. They were frightened. They were depressed. The literature of that time shows people wandering, very similar to our sort of exile, the diaspora literature of today. It was a similar kind of world. And Epicurus says, why are we listening to all these old fears? He says, there are three things people are frightened of. Pain. And pain is usually either bearable, or if it's terribly unbearable, it's usually short. No, you'll either get over it or it'll kill you. Just forget about it. Stop worrying about it. You spend more time worrying about pain than actually being in pain. And he says, the next thing people are worried about is death. And forget death. When you're dead, you're so dead that it's none of your business. You're never going to ask yourself, am I alive? And the answer is going to be no. You're good. <laughs> Life is this. Life is when you're here. Life is when you're here. Don't you worry about the rest of it. And Epicurus says, the last thing that scares people to death is the gods. And he says, guess what? There are none. No problem. He says, look, and I am getting to the dream thing. This is the point. He says, look, I know that you have evidence of gods. You've dreamed them. They've come to you. You've seen them spectrally at night. And he says, and I love this, because instead of a rationalist today looking back and saying, well, obviously, well, that's just hokum, he lived in the culture where people were seeing these things, talking about these things. And so he said, look, this universe is probably not the only one. There's probably another universe on all sides of us. And in the spaces between the universes, there are these floating spectral things that look like what we thought the gods looked like. But they don't know we're here. <laughs> they don't think. They didn't make us. They don't do anything. But, he said, they're happy. <laughs> They've solved the problem of mood. And for that, we should worship them a little. So Epicurus said, you want to love the gods, let's love them. They're happy. They figured out how to not be upset all the time. But he said, they're not really real. We just, the, but what I love about it, along the lines that you brought up, is that because he lived in the culture, it was too hard to just say, oh, no, that's all just bullshit. He couldn't because he'd heard too many friends that he trusted say, oh, I dreamed that Zeus said this and that, this and that. So he said, okay, there's some reason why we're having these visions, because something does exist that's contacting us in some way or something, but they're not gods. Forget it. They don't care about us at all. Um, and it changed the way people thought about it. And it was one of the dominant religions, I call it graceful life philosophies, for centuries. Centuries. What would be your answer now to that kind of question? Because I presume most of us here believe we could be happy without believing in God. Right. There are people who probably agree in your book or you. Right, your well. Question, what do you say to them? Because exactly. They still have the dreams. They still... Right. If their parents are in heaven because they dreamt about them. Right. Well, the truth is, there. 
I thought you were asking something different at first, and now I'm going to answer the second part first. I mean, how do I answer somebody who's religious or who thinks that they have evidence? It depends how much I like them. If I like them, I will try to convince them about how they have been fooled. Um, if I don't, I say, live and be well. Um, it was only that that made me start to be this much of an out atheist, that I realized, eh, if I'm doing it for people I like, I guess I should try more broadly. You know, I decided that live and let live, if I wouldn't do that to someone I cared about, if someone I cared about was sweating over something I thought was completely a fantasy, you know, they were gluten-free or something, <laughs> I'm kidding, I don't know about that. I'm just saying. If I care about them, I'm going to say to them, you know, I'm going to try to explain what, how this all comes about culturally. Um, the, the, the other part of happiness, you know, I think that we have to do this work of figuring out some of the things, when, when you're not living like the people who came before, you have to both draw on what they gave you, and also start to try to think clearly, or at least somebody in the culture has to, about what we've lost and how we can get it without having to do the parts that we don't like. And sometimes you have to compromise. You know, sometimes you have to say, well, you wake up in the morning, well, about half of you didn't want to come in the way you first woke up in the morning. Like, what did I say I was going to do? Well, I prepaid. Right? Um, um, no, there's a great ancient Greek uh, quote that's about skepticism, about how much we all change, that says, uh, he who was invited to dinner yesterday comes uninvited today. Because we change so much that, yeah, you were invited yesterday, but they, they might not even want you to. I mean, that we change, you know, that this is, that this is so. But yeah, I think that um, the, the thing, one of the things I notice is, Mega churches in this country are almost only in places where there's not an obvious way to get community otherwise. You're lonely. So that we see no mega churches even in relatively still religious New England because they have a history of these all little churches that's taking care of that for them. Here, there's a lot of places to go. You know, the theater. We get a lot of our emotional needs at the theater. And especially if we also talk about it, and we also enact it in some ways, um, there's a tremendous amount that's there if you take part in it in a place like this, which is why people like us come to a place like this. Uh, you talked about uh, proper atheist behavior. Mm -hmm. What about apathyism? Mm -hmm. because, yeah. Uh, I, I the mean, fastest apathyist. growing, yes. The I'm fastest. Apathyist. Yeah. Good. Uh, I think, well, it exists, it doesn't exist, it just doesn't interest me, I'm not, I'm not likely to see him any time soon, right. anytime right. soon, let's get on with it. I get that, I get that, and I think a lot of people are. Indeed, it's the fastest growing religious group in this country are people who answer none. It's a recent Pew study. They, they just say none. They don't identify as atheist. They just say none to the answer of what their religious affiliation is or what their religious connection is. Um, the apathyist idea, you know, I say in doubt that people who are really rabid atheists, and I guess I'll say, yeah, okay, little rabid, little, but um, so are, have more in common with religious people in a certain way, in that we care profoundly about the meaning of life, about ritual, about marking time every year, about what it all means, about morality. We're struggling over these issues, right? So the vast majority of people actually don't care that much. They, they do what I call, and I don't mean this pejoratively, even though it's funny, drop by and lie religion. They mostly don't care, but guess what? Human beings need ritual for a couple of things. We need ritual for marriage, because otherwise you just met this guy in a bar and now you're flesh of his flesh. How are you going to convince yourself of that? You need ritual. You need community. You need liturgical speech and abstract symbolic gestures that you've seen in the past to help you with that. And you can do supernatural or not supernatural, but liturgical gestures help you believe that you've actually now made this commitment. Now try having a baby. Oh, I'll just eat some stuff for nine months and then suddenly my brain couldn't make a single eye in a hundred years if you put all the material on a table, but my stupid body did it twice. How? Nobody knows. You know we can't create a baby in a lab. Without a placenta, we are lost. We can create the very beginning and we're gone. We don't know how. I mean, 
So the, the, my, my point is that apathyism is it's a, a totally respected position. I understand going about other things, but I just like I have philosophical problems, meaning I worry about time. I think about how it moves fast or slow. I worry about the reality of existence since there's more space in this table than there is atoms if you look on a on the right scale. So why can't I get my through? It, reality is weird. So I'm just trying to say, for me, I'm deeply obsessed with these questions, but no, I can imagine being past them. I know that most people are not obsessed with the problems that obsess me, so I, I can't really judge the different ways. But I think we're just going to take one more question and then we're done just because we ran out of time. Though I'll be, hang around a little while and I'll be glad to chat. And, um, and also, I'm super easy to find on the interwebs. You just put my name in, you get my uh, website, and it has my regular friends' email, the, the same email I give to friends. It's just jennifermichaelhecht at gmail.com. I will read it immediately, and I will get back to you as soon as I can, sometimes immediately, sometimes later. But I love hearing from people. I really love it. So, so, and, and it doesn't have to be even within the year. You write to me, you say, we've talked, and I'll say, okay, what's up? Okay, thank you so much.